Well, on one point, I'll let you into a top secret. I know one who wears very small shoes with high heels, but then she's a police woman. No, actually, they're much the same as any other group of well-set-up, hard-working Englishmen. Anyway, they don't look like a bunch of spibs or butterfly-brained playboys. Definitely not. They've got a tough job to do, and they take their work seriously. But can you imagine what a problem it must have been when Scotland Yard got mixed up with a volatile, voluble little Frenchman who was also, just to make it more interesting, slightly off his head. His name was Jean-Pierre Bacchier. And he was one of those annoying types of people who would do something that would prove him to be absolutely crazy and then follow it up by a reasoned, a logical action in proof of his sanity. Rather handsome, rascal, this little Bacchier, with striking brown eyes, moustache, pointed beard, and all. Most attractive in his typical French way. At least the ladies thought so. Particularly, Mrs. Jones of By Street, England, who met him in a hotel in Beardit, where she'd gone to recover from a nervous breakdown. Bacchier was a wireless operator and gave concerts at the hotel using his own wireless set. Of course, this was back in the days of 1923 when broadcasting was a babe in arms, so to speak. But he was never too busy to cast a languishing eye on the ladies, and he very often got a prompt answer, as he did for Mrs. Jones. Bacchier spoke little English, but did that matter? Well, as you know, the language of love is universal. Just to improve his vocabulary, Bacchier bought a dictionary, and the flirtation began to flourish. In fact, it was doing very well indeed, when one day Mrs. Jones got a telegram from her husband. I'm so home, Jean-Pierre. Uh, no, no, ma chérie, do not leave me. I am desolate, how you say it, are broken. I must be dead. No, no, it is too soon. You go, I come with you. Oh, goodness, no, that would never do. You forget I'm a married woman. Married? Are we the husband? Forget him, marry me. I love you. <laughs> your English certainly has improved, John Pierre. Oh, no, my holiday is over and my worries begin again. I decided to go over. So, regretfully, Mrs. Jones returned to England, and the little inn at Bifee called the Blue Anchor. Not one of those historic and picturesque things you read about in books and which you can still find all over England on postcards. No, it was rather an ordinary country pub and hotel. Alfred Jones had bought it and was beginning to wish he hadn't. With no head for liquor and even a worse one for business, it's not altogether surprising that at this time he found himself in a spot of trouble financially. In fact, uh, he became so worried about it that his wife had a nervous breakdown. That took the fun. It had been her own idea. Also, the love affair with Bacchier. That had been her own idea, too. And she tactfully forgot to tell her husband about it. But a few days after her return... Who should turn up all of a sudden but, yes, of course, Jean-Pierre Bacchier, in person and highly delighted with himself for having thought up what he considered in his crazy way to be a very clever, bona fide excuse for his trip to England. Now listen how he explains it all to this stupid English husband, Mr. Jones. Your son, Mr. Jones, I sell the machine for me saucisson. How you say saucisson? Oh, uh, what is this you mean? Yes, I understand a little French myself, Mr. Vacuum. Ah, oui, c'est ça. Saucisson, sausages. Oui, oui. Oh, you're a salesman, then? Comment? I think that if Mr. Vacuum means he wants to sell the machine he's invented. He's telling me about it before you came downstairs. Oh, he's an inventor. An inventor, oui, oui. I make the money, be rich. Well, I wish you luck. Here, find the register, please. Yes, come on. So, with bold search of his pen, as bold as the man himself, Vacuum signed his name in the guest book of the Blue Anchor. Up with his broken English, his ever-present dictionary, and his stories of the marvellous inventions he was working on, the people at the inn enjoyed themselves immensely, poking sly fun at him, and were glad to have him around. And uh, Mrs. Jones, was she glad to have him around? Apparently, for they took many walks together in quiet country lanes, and it was soon evident that Bacchier was deeply infatuated with her. Evidently, Mr. Jones, the husband, was not as observant as he might have been. But then, uh, husbands never are, are they? Poor man. He caught a chill shortly after Bacchier arrived. And by the time he was well enough to be up and about, he had all his other worries to occupy his mind. While he'd been sick and his wife had been roaming about the countryside with her bit of old Provence, business had been going from positively shocking to absolutely ludicrous. Now, see here, Mabel. We've got to do something about these extensions. 
Our bills are running pretty high, you know. More than we can afford. Oh, there you go again, trying to get me all upset. What do you expect me to do about it? Well, the fact is, we're pretty far in debt now. Got to face it, you know. You ought to do more serving at the bar and less drinking yourself. Well, that's got nothing to do with it. I'll have a drink or two whenever I want one. Two drinks when you want one. You never said a true word. More like two dozen, if you ask me. Well, a good landlord has got to take a, take a nip now and again with his guests. Keep them spending money. Oh, money, money. Now we've started on that again. Well, it's getting serious. What about this Vachier fellow now? Well, what about him? Well, do you realize he hasn't paid us a penny for his board and lodging since he came here? Oh. Well, he says he's waiting for some money from America. He ought to be getting about 500 pounds for his patient on his staff, you see. Any day now. A uh, likely tale. I don't believe a word of it. That fellow had the nerve to come to me this morning and ask for a loan to tide him over. He did? Well, I, I hope you didn't give it to him. No fear. I'll see the color of his money first. I swear to that, yeah, it was entirely logical to try and borrow money from Mr. Jones. He owed him for food and board, so why not owe him some money as well? As a matter of fact, Bucky had already borrowed 14 pounds from Mrs. Jones. No wonder she wasn't very keen on her husband loaning him some more money. I'm pretty sure Bucky wasn't crazy enough to believe his tales of riches to come. Actually, he was Tony Broke. But to maintain his fiction of being a great inventor, he had to have supplies to work with. So, presently, we find him in a chemist shop in London. Salt nitrate, oxide of tin, acetate of copper, sodium acetate, iodine, chloroform. Yes, uh, I can let you have those. Excellent. Uh, what do you need all these for? I am an inventor. I mix the wireless. Well, oh, I see. But what about this uh, chloride of mercury? That's a poison, you know. Mystic poison? Yes, they're both deadly poison. Me? I need them. You'll have to be pretty careful. In La France, I buy. Well, uh, uh, I suppose it must be all right, but you'll have to sign for them in the poison book. Oh, wait, wait, I sign. Here it is. Now, if you just put your name on this list, J. Wanker. W-A-N-K-E-R. That's your name? Wait, wait, yes. Tell me, uh, what do you use the chloroform for? Oh, it's I tell you, oh. the night I no sleep, take me to sleep, sleep like baby. Oh, so what you foreigners won't think of. Truly a man of ingenuity, this Sarkey, don't you think? And he had good reasons for the rest of his night. He wanted to go back to his own country, to France. But somehow he hadn't been able to persuade Mrs. Jones to accompany him. Her interest in him seemed to be cooling off. <laughs> Don't ask me again. Oh, Mum, you kill me. I suffer. Oh, don't talk that nonsense. Oh, don't be so silly. We buy a hotel for you, yes? Hotel? What do you mean? You buy. You sell blue anchor? Buy this one. I have pictures. See? La Vie Maria. Oh, it's really painted out. Oh, that's nice. Oh, where is this place? I shall be near the alley where I meet you. And it's the same, is it? No, oui. They say you buy hotel or restaurant, leave husband to come with me. But my husband owns the blue anchor. I couldn't tell it without him knowing about it. Then he tells, we take husband with us. I love you so much, my baby. But all that is passionate feelings were of no avail, and his vanity was hurt. To think that he, the fascinating, the captivating, ever back here, he, the irresistible, could be resisted. Oh, he's as monstrous. Unbelievable that she wouldn't leave her husband instantly when she knew he had told her that he loved her so passionately. Ah, well, if that was not enough, he must be subtle. He must plan. Would the proposed hotel at saint jean de Luz be sufficient date? The stupid Mr. Jones was intrigued with the idea and even discussed the possible means of paying for the villa. True, it meant he would have to come along as well as his wife, but Bache was sure he could easily overcome a trifling obstacle like an inconvenient husband. A few nights later, the Joneses had a party for some of the local people. Mr. Jones, who prided himself on being a good host, did rather well with the drink. And uh, next morning woke up feeling the effects of the night before. Not so Mrs. Jones, of course. Competent as usual, he busied about getting the day's work started. The first event was a complaint from the cook, Mrs. Fisher. You wish to see to that gentleman, Mum. Mr. Bastier, what's the trouble? Well, he's in there, sitting in the parlour. He won't move. 
And what with the housemaid not here today, I've got all the dusting to do, and he won't get out of the way. He's studying up him coming down every morning just to make his own coffee. But he's just sitting in there in the bar parlor, pretending not to understand a word I say. Oh, well, I'll go and have a talk with him, Mrs. Fisher. And try to sit up in hot shade and water for Mr. Jones. Now, Bacquier generally had his breakfast in the coffee room with the Joneses. This particular morning, he'd come down early, about seven o'clock, and planted himself firmly in the bar parlor, refusing to budge. It was cold in there. The fire hadn't been lit. Yet, in spite of Mrs. Fisher's grumbling and all Mrs. Jones's wheedling, Bacquier refused to move from the armchair by the ingle nook. There he sat, huddled up in his overcoat. Look, is it three, dear? What's he saying? I think he means he'll stay here. Ah. Have a little move, that's plenty. Mrs. Fisher. Mr. Bacquier understands a lot more English than you. Well, when I've got my work to do, Mum, um, I have to hold it down in a minute. Perhaps he can persuade Mr. Bacquier to move into the coffee room. His French is better than mine. Yes, see, madam, I am content. Oh, you. I don't think I'll go to the bank this morning, Mabel. Oh, uh, morning, Becky. Bonjour, Monsieur Jones. Come after that. Oh, not so good. Too many drinks. Then Mrs. Fisher. Tell William I want him. He can go to the bank for me. Save me the tip. Yes, sir. I'll see him in here. Yes, sir. Alfred, I wish you'd persuade Mr. Vecchio to move out of this room. He doesn't want to go. It's very awkward. I can't have the room set and clean with him in here. I really... Oh, one thing at a time, Mabel. I need my morning dose of salt first. My head's still a bit muzzy. There's a jug of fresh water and some clean glasses on the bar. Yes, I've got it. Where did you put those salts? I haven't touched it, Alfred. But in the use of paper on the mantelpiece. The captain you enjoy, Madame Jean? Well, my husband did. I went to bed early. Yeah, what's wrong with these salts, Mabel? They don't fit properly. <laughs> you! Oh, I say they taste bitter. Oh, here, let me look. Let me taste them. They are bitter. Somebody's been tampering with these salts. Oh, what's oh, the matter, Alfred? Oh, oh. Oh, I see all. Oh, I'll get them to him. Can you say that? Oh, no. I'll get the doctor. Quickly. Oh. But neither the old-fashioned remedy of tea and soda, nor in the end the doctor's professional care could help him. An hour later, Alfred Jones was dead. A fixed poison. <laughs> Responsible for the death of Alfred Jones. Was it his wife Mabel? Had she finally decided to run off with a dapper little Frenchman? Or was it back yet? Had he, in his twisted mind, decided he could persuade Mrs. Jones to come with him if her husband was out of the way? Was that why he'd been sitting in the cold parlor waiting for the moment when Mr. Jones would gulp down that innocent looking drink of deadly poison? Mrs. Jones immediately told the doctor her suspicions about the salt in the bottle. Mm. And you say they tasted very bitter? Yes, I, I... I put some into my hand and tasted them with my fingertips. Then I wiped my tongue with a handkerchief. Where is the bottle now? I, I put it away in the kitchen. Well, so come with me, I'll show you where it is. In the kitchen? That's an odd place to put it. Well, I, I was a bit upset about my husband at the time, and I... I had the bottle still in my hand, but when I went to get him some tea and soda, I thought it might help. It might be useful in some cases, but not for sticking. The action is too quick. And all signs of your husband's death point to strychnine poisoning. In here, Doctor. It's in this dresser drawer. Oh, yes. Here you are, Doctor. Hmm. Not much left in the bottle, is there? Well, there was only about a tablespoon. Oh, then when... This it... bottle seems to have been washed out recently. Look, it's wet inside and the salt is partially dissolved. Oh, that's odd. Do you know anything about this? Oh, no, I... I haven't been in the kitchen since I put it away in the drawer. Mrs. Jones, I also want the spoon and the glass your husband used. And I'm taking them, all of them, straight to the police. I should think he would. It's a logical thing to do. And Mrs. Jones quite naturally went in search of Mrs. Fisher, the cook. Mrs. Fisher, you saw me put that bottle away. First thing I've extended. Sure, I don't know, Mum. Unless it was that Frenchman, it's the best. Yes, it was just like the doctor gave I was cleaning the scullery, and the Frenchman came in the kitchen and said something about the doctor. 
Betty, Betty, you know the way he talks. I just pointed to the dresser drawer. Did he take the bottle out? I couldn't write his phone on I heard him open the drawer and then close it, and then he went out. I was busy and I didn't pay much attention. But, but it, if he was the person who washed out that bottle, why, when did he bring it back? Plenty of time to do that. I, I was in and out of the kitchen several times. Oh, I, I can't believe that Mr. Vassier had anything to do with my husband's death. I mean, you helped to carry him up to Foreign news you can't ever trust them. Poor Mr. Jones. Yes, 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 Madame Jones. The doctor is gone. Mr. Jones is cushioned. No, Jean-Pierre. My husband is not sleeping. He's dead. Dead. Mon Dieu, oh, madame, I regret to think your word is dead. And you've done it. What? There's a man no man. I think you did it. Oh, madame, do not accuse me. Madame, let us have a for the jury. You'll need it then. You know, I think Mrs. Fisher's got something there. With true Latin fervor, Bacchier was putting on a beautiful scene for Mrs. Jones, kneeling at her feet. With the tears pouring down his face, he protested his innocence. But Mabel Jones listened to him dry-eyed, her former love for Vacquier completely dead. She couldn't prove her suspicions, but she was convinced that this man had deliberately poisoned her husband. If you were uh, in Mabel Jones's position, what would you have done? Gone at once to the police and informed them that the man you thought you'd loved was a murderer? Would you? I wonder. It's a hard decision to make. Mrs. Jones wasn't equal to it, so she did nothing. But Scotland Yard became interested when it was learned that Mr. Jones's body contained one-tenth of a grain of sickening, enough to kill not just one man, but several. So the priest was soon making inquiries. Yes, Inspector. Mr. Jones was a pretty heavy drinker. I've seen him the worst for wear several times. Yes, the froggy was with us on the night on the party Saturday night. Uh, but he left early. About eleven, I'd say. A bottle of salt for you, you kept on the mantelpiece. Anyone could have put the poison in. I didn't know that, Mr. Witt. It's the Frenchman you want, Inspector. Mark my word. No, monsieur. I do not kill Mr. Jones. I love him more like his brother. But Mrs. Jones knew differently. Point blank, she had it out with that kid. You have killed my husband. Yes, Ned. I do it for you. Get out of my house. Go away. Leave me. Oh, I'll never do it again. Bacquier did leave and moved to another hotel in Woking a few miles away. Here, to heal his wounded pride, he soon aroused a great deal of interest in himself by his fantastic speculations. He wrote three long statements in French to the police suggesting that the murderer had been George, the potman of the Blue Anchor, Mrs. Jones's solicitor, who, according to Bacquier, was madly in love with her, or some unknown coward who had been a willing accomplice at the hotel. But himself, never. Many was the time he carried Mr. Jones upstairs and put him to bed when he'd overindulged his little weakness. And as he very reasonably pointed out, what better opportunity could he have had? Pillow or some chloroform of his face for a minute or two, and voila, he knew. But had he done so? No, said Bacquier. It would have been the act of a madman to precipitate events in a manner so cowardly and brutal. Yes, those are his actual words. The act of a madman. Bacquier went on to argue quite logically that if he'd planned murder... He would have waited until Mr. Jones had sold his two cars, as he was going to. Waited until he sold his hotel, which he had decided to do. And collected on an 800-pound loan, which was due to be paid him. Then Mr. Jones would have had about 4,000 pounds in hand, with which to buy the villa in France. So you see, said Bacquier, I could surely have waited for all this to be accomplished first. For I knew all about their affairs. Now, I ask you, what are you going to do with a fellow who can reason things out as shrewdly as that, and yet when it comes to actions, is as mad as a mouse hare? All murders have an abnormally large streak of vanity, and that day, well, of course, his vanity passed all bounds. For instance, wouldn't you think in a certain sense he might try a photographer? But no, not he. He was delighted when a press photographer asked for his picture. He utterly failed to foresee it might mean disaster for him. It did. Next day, a certain chemist called at Scotland Yard. I've been reading the papers about the murder at Byfleet, Inspector. I noticed the cause of death is given as strychnine poisoning. That's correct. And not a very pleasant way to die, either. No, I feel very sorry for the poor chap. Have you any information about his death? Well, 
As a matter of fact, that's what I wanted to see you about. There was a picture in today's paper. I brought it with me. Here, uh, this one here. Uh, oh, yes. Jean Piervacchia. He was living in the hotel at the time of the murder. I'm positive, Inspector. He's the same man who bought some strychnine from me. He did? When? About a month ago. He said he wanted it for wireless experiments. Huh. That's a new excuse for buying poison. You're sure it's the same man? Absolutely, Inspector. I'd recognize him anywhere. Well, we'll hold an identification parade and see if you can pick this man out from a crowd. As you probably know, when such a parade is held, a number of persons of the same general appearance and height and weight are brought all together in a room. Among them is a suspect or suspects. Mr. Bland, the chemist, had no trouble in picking up that kid. There he is, Inspector. That's the man. Bonjour, Mr. Kenneth. How are you? Can you beat him? That guy, instead of being scared stiff when the chemist recognized him, was as pleased as punch. Took it as a compliment for his distinguished appearance that he remembered him so well. But his terrific vanity suffered a nasty shock when he was promptly arrested for the murder of Alfred Jones. The trial of Jean-Pierre Bacquier took place at Guilford Surrey. The courtroom as a whole used generally for local dances and seemed to give the appearance of a temporary stage setting. Watching Bacquier, you would have thought him only an interested and amused spectator and an entertainment put on for his benefit. Hair and beard were always neatly brushed and perfumed with virus. Every day he wrote copious notes and kept the warders busy sharpening his pencils. As the evidence was passed into him by an interpreter, he listened attentively and made little jokes in French. When a certain Mr. Boutel, who was giving evidence, answered that by profession he was both a builder and an undertaker, Bacquet's laughing comment was, Ah, he houses them above and below ground. On the fairest of his trial, Bacquet had only one thing to say. He, the great Jean-Pierre Bacquet, was not allowed to take a greater part in the proceedings. He wasn't allowed to do all the talking. What the character? Top filling and still complaining about his part. Well, I don't suppose there would have been any change in the verdict if he had. For when he did give evidence, his stories were so fantastic, they made it very easy for the learned counsel prosecuting him. His fairy tale about buying the poison was laughable. You admit, Becquier, that you bought the strychnine? But yes, a man asked me, the solicitor of Madame John. What was his name? I not know. I see him in the blue anchor. And this man came to you and asked you to buy him the strychnine. But yes? You mean to say that a man you didn't know just casually came up and asked you to buy poison for him? Oh, I see him two or three times. Did he give you any reason for wanting this poison? He say he have dog, sick dog, want to kill it. I say in La France we kill sick dog with strychnine. And what did he say to that? He say excellent. And you agree to do? I say I buy, he say good, he give me one pound note. And then you bought the strychnine. For him, you say? I buy, I give him. When did you give it to him? The Sunday he come to the Blue Anchors, I give him. What was the date? Not the one. And four weeks later, Mr. Jones was murdered. No, Bacchie, you may have been a clever rogue, but this story is entirely too far fetched. He went on to relate how he'd been told to sign a false name in the poison red book at the chemist shop. And although the sickening cost all of tuppence, a man never asked for his change from a pound note. Mr. Justice Avery, in summing up the jury, brought up another point. What had become of the perchloride of mercury, also a deadly poison, which had been bought at the same time? Quite contrary to the chemist's evidence, Bacchier denied ever purchasing any. Perhaps Sir Justice his lordship, somebody else at the Blue Anchor, had asked him to buy the perchloride of mercury in order to kill another dog? Perhaps Bacchier was going into the business on a wholesale basis. The jury did not take long to bring in a verdict of guilty. Perhaps one of the strangest things Vakier did was while he was in Wandsworth's prison awaiting execution. He made a statement that after the death of Alfred Jones, he'd seen a woman, either Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Fisher, the cook, he didn't know which, go to a tool shed in the garden behind the blue anchor. Being curious, he went to investigate, and behind a loose brick in the wall, he found a bottle of strychnine he said he had bought with his visitor. Police immediately searched the tool shed, and they found not one, but two glass bottles. One contained strychnine crystals, and the other strychnine in liquid solution. 
Both Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Fisher were able to satisfy the police they knew nothing about it. And the police never did find out who bought this poison or where. If Bartier knew it was there, why hadn't he mentioned it at his trial? Why wait until the information couldn't possibly do him any good? And at this point tomorrow. Never put off till tomorrow what you could do today. For the Bartier, tomorrow never 